Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning to this lovely Sunday morning in Cannes. Um, congratulations to all of you who managed to get here this morning. Um, my name's Amanda Neville. I'm the um, CEO, actually, my title now, of the um, British Film Institute, and it's lovely to welcome so many of you here. Um, it's a really important moment, I think, and I think the moment will felt to be mostly important, possibly not today, but perhaps in 10, 20, 30 years, because I think it's our children who will have expected us, actually, to have got on and to have, have done this. So today is the, the formal launch of the British Standard, and BS8909, which is a very sexy Sunday morning title for something that's really important about a sustainability management system for the whole of the UK film industry. What does sustainability mean? You all know, because obviously you're great fans of it, which is why you're here. But in very simple terms, it's making sure that what we do today doesn't in any way compromise the ability of future generations to do what they also need to do as well. In fact, there's a clear definition here, and I'm going to read it out because it's a mantra we need to repeat a lot over coming weeks. Is It's to meet the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own need. Now, this was started by the UK Film Council, and a, you know, big cheers to them, and they've passed over the baton to us. But I think my impression is that it was a very easy touch paper to light because actually the momentum behind the catalytic work of the Film Council to get this going has been very much led from the heart of the industry. So I would really like to stress that today is not about a beginning. It's actually a validation of some really important work that is already happening and has been happening with huge success across the industry itself. My understanding is many countries have um, you know, taken up this baton, but they've taken it up in different sectoral parts of the industry. And I think in Britain or in the UK, fantastically, we have a first, because this is a formal standard which has been taken up across the entire value train, chain of the industry itself. Why is it important? I know I don't need to tell you. It's important because it's our social and um, it's our social responsibility to ensure we do this. And I think it's great that the film industry, which people love for its glamour and the fact that so many people enjoy cinema, we are a great um, part of the industry to take up that flag and, and fly it. But there are also really solid reasons why it makes sense. It makes economic sense. It makes your bottom line better. So it's something that's really worth it from the bottom, you know, from the bottom line of those budgets. Um, at the BFI, we're really committed to it. We've been part of the working party since the Film Council launched it um, a while ago. Um, going forward, we've got some very exciting announcements about our archive. We are leading on some new models and ideas down at BFI Southbank. And we're definitely, hopefully, going to be working in partnership with you to look at ways in which we can tie it into our production funding requirements going forward. So we're 100% committed. So I think it's a really exciting moment for the planet here in France. Um, and I'm going to hand over to now to the person who has been the real protagonist and um, the real cheerleader of this from the start. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Newbigin. <laughs> Good morning, and, uh, and thank you, Amanda. Uh, I'm, I'm billed as the chair of Creative England, which I am, but uh, really the reason why I'm here is, of course, personally, I'm very committed to the whole idea that lies behind this standard. But I chaired uh, at the invitation of the British Standards Institution and the UK Film Council the group that drafted uh, the terms of the standard. And as Amanda said, this is a world first in a number of different respects. In a sense, the most important aspect of that to stress here is it really is for the whole industry. And it's something which has been written and created by the whole industry. So the, the drafting group that wrote the standard had it, sustainability experts, it had officials from the British Standards Institution, but it also had people representing the industry from production, distribution, exhibition, sales, from the trade unions, from archives, right across the whole piece, so that this is something that every part of the industry has had an opportunity to feed into and to comment on and to learn from. And one of the things that we'll be doing in a minute is uh, I'm going to introduce a number of people who do represent different parts of the industry to talk about how it's worked in practice. But it's, uh, it's also a world first in a number of other respects. 
it's the first time that, uh, that the industry has produced something which really attempts to look at sustainability right across the piece. In other words, this is more than just a kind of green code. And, uh, and the reason why we've gone for that wider definition of sustainability is that the first meeting that the UK Film Council held, which invited 20 or 30 organizations from across the UK industry to get together, that first meeting was unanimous in saying, we want this to be a full-on sustainability system. In other words, it's looking at the social and economic impacts of the film industry as well as the green impacts. That may make it seem more complicated, but it is obviously a much more integrated and sensible way of looking at things. And in a third way, too, it's a world first, because while different industries, different film industries around the world have got very good and practical production codes, this is the first time that the film industry as a whole industry has got together with a national standards body, the British Standards Institution, to write something which is a formal British standard. And the particular value of that in the context of the film industry is that the BSI has got a pretty good track record in having its standards adopted by the World Standards Organization, the ISO. And uh, you know, to be blunt about it, a lot of the BSI standards are in use by leading parts of the American industry, Google, Microsoft, and so on, all use BSI standards for part of their work. And it means that potentially this could become a standard for international co-productions. So although it's a UK standard, it's been written by and is for the UK industry, it does have the potential to become uh, a world standard. And that's one of the things that makes it um, so, so potent and so valuable. A couple of other things I'll say about it, and then I'm going to introduce some people who've had practical experience of implementing it. Uh, and, and that is that, that these standards, although they're formal and official, they are voluntary. Uh, they're not an attempt to replace regulation. You buy into it because you believe in it. And it's a sustainability management system. In other words, it is not uh, a tick box which says, have you turned the lights out and turned the PCs off and are you going by train, not by plane? It's not that kind of thing at all. It is about you considering all the different aspects of your business that you need to take into account if you're going to run your business in a more sustainable way. And it enables you to start from the point where you are today and, and work in a systematic way to improve and upgrade your performance. That's the whole point of it. So it is a voluntary standard. Uh, it is not attempting to, to replace or second-guess legislation. It's designed to be of service to the companies that want to implement it. And I think that's, uh, that, again, is something which makes it uh, quite unique and unusual. And just to emphasize, finally, something that Amanda said, and that is that uh, it seems to me there are, there are three obvious imperatives in, in, in adopting or thinking about sustainability. One is there's an ethical consideration. As Amanda said, quoting from the standard, we shouldn't be compromising the future by the way we behave today. The second thing is that there is absolutely no doubt that uh, internationally, uh, environmental regulation and energy use regulation is going to get tougher. And that means that companies that are planning systematically for how they look at the costs that are going to be incurred in being more efficient are going to be saving themselves money and staying ahead of the game and not getting caught on the hop. Uh, and the third thing, of course, is that this has got a real economic significance. Not only uh, does it encourage companies to work in a more sustainable way and therefore reduce their costs, but our belief is that this is a point of real competitive advantage for the UK industry because we, we are fond of saying, and it's right to say, the UK is the best place in the world to come and make films. But this is, if you like, another tick to add to that box, which is to say, if you come to the UK, you're going to be working with an industry which really is working to high standards of sustainability right across the whole piece. And that makes it competitively and commercially an attractive proposition too. So for all those reasons, it makes sense. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce a number of people who will talk about uh, the trials that we've had of putting the standard into practice. Uh, and then we'll take some questions, uh, and then we'll see where we get to. Uh, but first of all, I, there's going to be a short promo from uh, Ealing Studios about some of the work that's gone on at Ealing. And then I'm going to ask James Spring, who's the managing director of Ealing Studios, to come and tell you a little bit about what they are doing and are planning to do at Ealing. Thank you.
Ealing Studios is committed to being a leader in sustainable film production and development. BS8909 provides an excellent framework for managing sustainability issues, impacts and outcomes. Sustainability makes sense for production. Lowering emissions often leads to lower costs, so that's something that we want to look at in all aspects of development and production here. The film industry needs to future-proof itself against future price rises that might arise from climate change, resource shortages and the like. And so sustainability has to be the forefront of all the film industry. quite audible but um, hopefully there's some sense of what we're doing. At Ealing Studios we're the only UK studio that actually produces, sells and distributes as well as being a facility for people to come and make their films and so we've always been interested in actually the impact that we can have on sustainability because we cross over a great deal of the various sectors of the industry that we work in. About, I was just talking to you, I think it was a couple of years ago when Green the Screen was first launched. I came down here and it was in a way incredibly easy to talk about what we wanted to do and the fact that we had fantastic green ambitions and that sustainability was very important to us. And I think there were various catchphrases that we used and it was all great. But what we were very aware of, you know, particularly over the last 12 months, is looking at you know, what have we actually done? And there are a huge number of people, both in the UK and globally, who are you know, attaching you know, a green badge to what they do. I think the big question is, though, that you know, what does that actually mean, and how do you measure it, and how do you manage that process? And that was one of the things that you know, we were very attracted to the British standard, is that you know, for us and for the industry in the UK, and hopefully, as John was saying, if it can be adopted, then worldwide, it gives a management system and structure through which you can actually implement green policy, but then it also gives something that is measurable so that you can really see whether you genuinely are making a difference. And you know, from the point of view of PR and marketing and telling the world what you're doing, you have something where rather than just talking about it, you can genuinely show the impact that you're having across the various uh, sectors of your business. What we've worked on specifically, which Tabitha will talk about more shortly, is the development area. Um, and you know, development's one of those things where you look at it and go, well, yeah, it's hardly a highly industrial process. You know, what are the issues? And they've just been you know, very simple things like you know, we suddenly, the volume of paper that was used in our development area because there were continually scripts being printed and it's just simply putting a system in place where you are effectively managing your need to utilize resources and then actually what you're doing is you're measuring against that at various benchmarks that you've set for yourself has made a huge difference to that area of the business. Simon George, who um, our Director of Finance and Operations, um, someone who on here, I don't know whether you could quite hear what he was saying, but funnily enough is most interested in the bottom line. And to Simon's deep joy, suddenly you know, we're starting to see actual tangible savings coming through that area. On the facilities side of the business, we're at the moment involved in a study which is to put photovoltaics um, onto the roofs of the stages. And I think you know, that will be something where suddenly looking at the numbers on that, it is an immense um, effect. It will have an immense effect on the business that we do going forward and on the economics of the studio. And so I think for us, you know, the attractions are you know, looking at the future and the obligation that we all share and the legacy that we all leave behind. But in the short term, there is a very tangible, practical and financial benefit that you can see both through adopting and working with the standard and then also growing beyond that and looking at what we can be doing you know, over the next five years but also beyond that and looking to future-proof businesses. So at this point, I think I'll hand back and then I think the panel will come up. Thank you. Oh. Say something else. James. Thank you, James. Um, now, we talked about the fact that this is a sustainability standard, which is looking at social and economic as well as environmental impacts, but we're just going to stick with the green dimension of it for a moment. One of the things that got me engaged in this initially was having a conversation with Alistair McGowan, who'd just come off a film shoot, 
And he said it was incredibly frustrating because almost everybody involved, cast and crew, had some kind of environmental awareness, but they were all arguing about where they should start. Should it be not having polystyrene cups? Were they complaining about the fact the script wasn't printed double-sided, the air con in the Winnebago's was, uh, was up too high, whatever? Nobody knew quite where to start. And one of the great things about having a standard, of course, is that it does help to put things into some sort of systematic order. The next person I'm going to introduce uh, is Melanie Dix, who's a partner with Greenshoot, which is a consultancy that provides management services for productions. And one of the, well, she'll tell you, what Greenshoot does is they come and they help a production company that is committed to sustainability and green practice to get their house in order and do it in a systematic, sensible way. So Melanie, oh, there you are. Uh, we're going to hear from you, and I think there's a short, uh, there's a short promo film. We're going to run that first. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Thank so, you. Melanie Dix. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. My name is Melanie Dix, and I'm from Green Shoot. We provide environmental consultancy and management services into the film industry. We provide practical help um, to everybody that's uh, sort of starting this journey of sustainability. Uh, we were asked to look at the production side of the film industry and we've used the films that we've worked on over the last three years as test cases for the framework for the standard. These include very initially, with the help of Eating Studio, Centrinians 2, that's where we started our journey in 2009. Most recently, Nanny McPhee 2, Sherlock Holmes 2, Johnny English Reborn. Uh, most recently, we're working on at the moment, is Ronin 47 and Gambit. Um, what we do as, as practical help to producers and cast and crew is produce a sustainability report that documents the economic, social and environmental impacts of the production, the wins, the challenges, the carbon footprint and how we've saved the emissions factors, the lowering the footprint and also fantastically being able to save money as well. So what we found as one of the challenges is it's not a checklist. It's a guide, it's a journey to help film productions raise their performance against sustainability and over time, year on year and by productions, improve that performance. What we found, it's not just about the environment. So obviously we go in and help recycle sets, construction waste, put in ethical supply chains, but it's also about the social and economic impacts that productions have and how filming generally as an industry body can become more sustainable over time. What we found initially was defining the scope and, and the boundaries that the scope of the 8909 had. And what our journey through trailing the 8909 was that we found the most important thing is that you start as early as possible. Briefing heads of department is absolutely critical. Some key elements with um, filming is um, inherent in the film industry, like cast travel. You'll never change that, but small tweaks will help both financially and the sustainable performance. The economic and social impacts of the standard, um, specific things like location filming, um, we were able to document over the course of six or seven films the impacts that crews have into local communities. So the noise, traffic pollution, um, how that we can sort of help the communities manage a, a crew of 100 people or up to 500 people most recently. Um, the community benefits, the inward investment into, the community, into communities is what we found is very, very large. Local employment, employing local people, hotels and shops. There's a massive inward investment that the film industry brings to local communities when they're filming. Um, and most recently, the heritage sites that we've been supporting, the uh, National Trust and also the Forestry Commission. We specifically have worked on three or four films at Richmond Park as part of the test case. And what we realised is we were able to help divert traffic where the filming communities were sort of based, divert them around very sensitive ecological areas and tree lines and help support the tourism that was going in there so we didn't affect various areas that um, were happening normally. And the, so we kind of minimised the effect of what was going on in the parks. I think the biggest challenge for anyone starting the 809 is changing sort of embedded working practices that are there at the moment. Now, what we find is that you can't change things overnight. This is a very long process. But what we have found is small, tiny changes and fixes have had very, very big impacts on production sustainable performance. 
the winds are something to be... Um, initially, lots of producers said to me, it's going to cost too much, I don't know where to start. And it's only by finishing films and providing a report that we can do a return on investment for producers and say, this is what we've saved, this is what you've spent, but this is also what you've saved, and also supporting local communities and charities. So we've been able to donate props, to be able to recycle and reuse clean wood into people that had some smaller or more challenged budgets, um, donate paints to local paint centres. We were able to um, donate 16 fridges and microwaves off two of our last films to Fair Share that we support in London, which is a charity for the vulnerable and homeless. And obviously the recycling aspects as well, keeping it from landfill. So that's where Green Shoot are at the moment. And I believe now we're going to show a short film that was shown at BAFTA um, about greening the screen last year. Thank you very much. procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedience, of delays is coming to its close. In its place we are entering a period of consequences. Because of the nature of the industry we've got to strike sets very quickly. When we're striking sets the costs of renting a stage outweighs the cost of trying to recycle. But we're trying to circumnavigate that and trying to do the best we can both ways. The main issue is, the, is basically the amount of waste that we generate every day that up until now has just gone basically to landfill. Here is where CO2 is now. Look how far above the natural cycle this is and we've done that. We're recycling at the moment 92% of all the construction waste, that's the set. So everything you see here, all the film sets, all the food, the, everything that people are eating off, the plastics that are being used on set is all being fully recycled. Within the first six weeks of prep that we've had um, and the first week of shoeing, we've diverted the tons that would have been initially sent to landfill that we've now recycled. I think at the end of the shoot, it would be, be a really drastic amount that we would have saved. Employing green shoot, it, it wasn't a, uh, that much more of an additional cost. In fact, in, in, in many cases, it was a savings to us. Within a year or two years maximum, I, I imagine every film will be uh, adopting a green policy. Uh, certainly the studios are adopting it um, and taking it forward from there, as, as they should be. It's got to be the future. It really has. We can't carry on the way we have been by discarding all this waste and these sets and putting them into landfill. We have to find an alternative because we're running out of holes to put all our uh, rubbish into. So we have to have, a, have some sort of alternative. So um, right at the end there, there's a number of web addresses you saw on the screen, and we'll come back to that, where you can find out more information about BS8909 if you want to. And as part of the process of getting there, I'm now going to invite a number of people to come up on the platform and maybe say a little bit about their contribution to this and also to take your questions for a few minutes. So Melanie, would you come back up? 
uh, and Tabitha Jenkins, who's head of production from Ealing, who you saw in the, the movie, and Anne Hayes from the British Standards Institution, who has been one of the people at the BSI who's been guiding this whole process from the BSI's point of view. And lastly, Juhi Sharif, uh, who's a consultant uh, who was working for Arup and is now working for a company called EcoAge. And Juhi um, has done, the she's been the consultant who's managed the whole process of trialing the standard for us to make sure that we're teasing out of the trial process <laughs> the questions, the difficulties, the problems that people have with the standard. So she's the person who, in a sense, has been closest to what it feels like uh, at, at the cutting edge. So thank you all for uh, joining me here on the platform. And I don't know, do you want to say anything very brief about, uh, about the BSI and its role in this and how you see the future of this standard? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, well, thank you very much. First of all, um, BSI are delighted to be involved with developing this standard. It is a first for the film industry, and it's great that the UK film industry are leading the way. Um, I think everybody's stressed here the importance that it is a sustainability standard, and it's, so it's covering the economic, social, and environmental impacts. And it is a real challenge to everybody in this room to actually pick up the mantle and start to make a change in the way you work and start to improve what you're doing and to reduce your impacts. Um, the standard is there as a framework. You don't have to use it, as John has said, but it is there as, as a framework for you to work on. Ultimately, you will be able to, I think, be audited on it and you would be able to be awarded a badge to say that you have complied with it. Um, and it is a big flag that you can wave for your businesses and to encourage people to come and do business with you. Thank you. Juhi, will you tell us a little bit about what it was like? Did you find people saying, what the hell is this? You're going to drive us all crazy. What was their response when you no started going through the standard with, with um, people? Uh, my experience has been that initially when people look at the standard, it, um, you know, it's written in semi-formal language. There's even a standard for writing standards called BS Nord. So um, I think that um, initially puts people off. But actually, um, it's really supposed to be appropriate to the scale and the nature of the business. Um, you know, it's not about creating a whole bunch of documentation and you know being very onerous. But it's it's just about integrating sustainability into your current practices. So it's looking at the whole scope of what you do and seeing where um, improvements can be made and um, and just measuring those improvements. And I think that one of the things um, that we don't talk about enough are the positive. Um, aspects of sustainability because we found during the trials that um, you know all of our the, all the trialees um, were actually doing some really uh, positive things whether it was for example Dogworth doing a lot of um, stakeholder engagement um, and Ealing already having some green production guidelines um, and uh, BFI already having you know reduced carbon by five percent this year um, there's some exciting things that are happening and a standard like this actually helps to um, communicate that in a cohesive way. Thank you. And look, just, I want to come to Tabitha in a moment, but just before we leave that, uh, one thing that would be worth saying is that the, you, can, you can see the standard on the BSI site. Uh, uh, there's also information about um, how to implement the standard in a, in a set of guidance notes which will be available. But I don't, Juhi, do you want to say something very brief about, uh, about the guidance notes? Or Anne, would you say something about the BSI site and what would be available on the BSI site? If people do want to implement the standard, how do they go about doing this? Because this is something which, it's, it's a standard that you buy from the BSI, isn't it? That's something which perhaps yeah. we haven't touched um, on yet. The website's up there. You do, you do have to buy the standard. Um, it's £92. Um, and uh, on that website, there are case studies. There are four case studies with the people that we're very grateful who tested the standard for us, and most of whom are represented here. We've got copies here. Um, and then the film industry themselves, you, you have developed some guidance to help uh, start this uh, challenge. I mean, as Juhi says, it is written as a formal standard. Formal standards are not always the best read, but um, it is possible to do it and you just have to work slowly. And all of that will be available on our website, on the BFI website, and probably numerous other places. Yes, the um, guidance notes that um, have been written are, uh, my understanding is that they're going to go up on the BFI site, and it's actually going to be a live place where as people start implementing the standard, um, you know, we will be putting up the case studies, and I think John is going to be involved in that. Um, but, you know, the, the clauses themselves, again, might seem a bit challenging when you first read them, but actually, you know, the work involved is, is not, uh, not a huge amount. 
Thank you. And I'll just draw your attention to the other web address that's up there on the screen, greeningfilm.com is a dedicated website that was launched by the UK Film Council and is now being managed by the BFI. And that brings together information about sustainability and green practice, not just from the UK industry, but from right around the world. It's got a lot of links to, uh, to other sites and to other organizations that are looking at sustainability issues. And if you are interested in exploring this whole area, Greening Film is a very good place to start. Uh, now, Tabitha, Head of Production at Ealing Studios. Do you want to add anything to what James said about what's going on at Ealing, what you've learned from trialling the standard and what you sure. intend to do in the future? Thanks. Yeah, so we um, specifically trialled the development process, but that took, it was the process from developing a script to the first day of principal photography. So essentially, it was about um, production to a certain extent as well because we were looking at the lead up to production. Um, and I think what Juhi says is very right, that to start with, when I first read the standard, it felt like it was there was quite a lot of management speak in there, but actually when you do get into it, it is quite simple. And the key is that you can, you can adapt what you're doing to suit your business. Um, and the most important thing that I think came out of it is the need to engage everyone you work with, especially your crews, because as everyone knows, when you get into productions, everyone's off making their own decisions and they have to have that, that autonomy to be able to get the film made. So it's all about giving them ways of doing that and within the structure that the standard allows you to develop um, so that they're not impeded in any way in terms of the speed or what they have to do to get the film made. It's all about empowering everybody around you to be able to do something that, you know, everyone wants to be more sustainable. And it's just about finding ways that you can help them do that. Um, so it's been a really good experience because I now feel like I know what we're going to be doing. Um, it's helped us put some more official guidelines in place and it's sort of tied together everything that we were already doing but into a more effective system so we are actually going to be, able, as James said, we are actually going to be able to measure it a bit better. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that I think we've, all of us who've been involved in the process of creating this standard have been struck by is how often we find we're pushing at an open door. In other words, this is something people do want to engage with, but it's quite difficult to know how you start in a practical way. And the point of this standard is it does create a framework in which you can begin to address some of these issues in what feels like a systematic, sensible, common sense way. So now we've got a few minutes left for questions. So if there are any questions, I don't know if there's a, a microphone roaming around somewhere. Uh, stand up and shout if you have got a question. Yes. Do you want to use uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, in general, as a producer, how, how you know, much in advance should I, for example, contact Green Shoot and you know, how much of the money is involved? Because, for example, we are doing now a film for 1.2 million and we won't be building any sets, but just for the little things like the catering and things like that. So how far in advance when we are in pre-production or is it in development stage, we should already start considering the Green Shoot? Um, I would say, we, we, what we've found is that starting as early as possible is great, but at the films we've done, we've come in six weeks before principal photography or eight weeks before, and we've had big, big impacts. And also, sort of from a financial side of it, every single film is different and treated on. And I think the one thing about sustainability and what Green Sheet want to do is to make sure that this isn't just for studio pictures, it's across the board for the British film industry. And we've been helping recently some student films and we've also been helping Warner Brothers. So from one end of the spectrum to the other because we're a very inclusive industry. Um, and I think as early as possible, you, the small things you can do as a producer will have a massive impact on your sustainability and will also save the bottom line at the end of the day as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, hi, I just wanted to say um, I'm at the other end of the exhibition end. Um, we haven't mentioned that much um, in terms of the buildings and the, the sustainability. Um, and is there any policy in place for exhibition or does it just apply to production? Um, actually, um, we trialled the standard um, with BFI for, from the perspective of them as exhibitors. So um, obviously, you know, especially now as a new uh, lead body for UK film, BFI's got an enormous remit. But we were looking specifically at their cinemas. We also looked at the bars. And that was uh, very much um, focused on facilities management initially. So it's about managing the energy and the, you know, the cooling systems and so on. Um, so the case study that's available for BFI is, is focused on that. Done our own for a year now, the, the Glasgow Film Festival, we're a wee bit ahead of the game 
so, so it's nice to tie it into to anything else. Thank you. So we feel as if we're a wee bit ahead of where we are. <laughs> um, but it's nice to see this um, standard just to get a feel for where it's going for the rest of the country. It would be really good to communicate what you guys have been doing in terms of best practice. So putting yeah. it up on websites and things. Yes. Yes, uh, you were talking about the um, savings uh, in filming in a green way, and, and then we started talking about other things, um, sort of more idea, idealistic and ethical things. And I, I'm, I understand that uh, recycling, instead of just chucking things away, is going to create savings in the long run for society more than um, producers and filmmakers. So I wanted to know if there were already some statistics specific statistics, uh, percentages uh, on a film budget of what is actually being saved uh, at the moment in filmmaking. One thing, if I could just take that, one thing that we're trying to push for is and um, looking at budgets and how budgets are presented is that there is no lines in there for sustainable spend and that's what needs to change sooner rather than later, especially to support the standard and the industry becoming more sustainable. I've looked through, I think, about 100 budgets through Sergeant Disc and through um, EP budgeting, and it's really hard. And what's interesting is that what we've found as a company is that there's savings to be made in strange areas. Departments will have a water budget, another department will have a waste budget, and then the art department will have a waste budget. But if you take those strands out and manage it, through the framework of the 899, which allows this journey, we, what we have found with the studios and smaller productions is there's always a saving at the end on the return on investment for using green practices. So it's a hard thing to quantify immediately to you, but there is ways that you can do it. And what producers, I think, have to do is make lines within that budget for, for elements of being green. Um, I was just going to say that actually um, you've hit upon a very important point, which is um, this data. We don't have enough um, data yet, and we're just at the, we are at the early stages of that journey. More people who use frameworks such as 8909 um, and start actually measuring what they're doing, you know, the more um, evidence we're going to have. And the only thing I was going to add is that we launched a standard in 2007 for the event industry, which is quite a while ago, and we're now starting to see real... Um, figures and data coming through about where people have saved, in particular on venues there with, with sort of energy costs and things like that, where they've actually dramatically managed to, ma managed to reduce their energy costs. But it will take a while for all that data to come through. And the more open you are with it, the more attractive it becomes to people. And just to add to that, I mean, it seems to me there's two elements to this. One is that lots of organisations that begin to implement new work practices find they get very easy, quick wins at first. Odeon, Cinema, uh, Odeon Group reduced their electricity bill by 10% in a year simply by introducing new housekeeping rules for their managers. And the UK Film Council reduced its carbon footprint by something like 30% in one year, mainly by looking at the way uh, travel costs were allocated. But I think the, the interesting thing about the standard is that it enables some people and some, some studios are already beginning to look at the issue of the longer term issue. If, if you start investing now in a new kind of equipment and new management systems, what is the payback period? Uh, and and how, how do you plan longer term? In other words, not just saving by turning off the lights before you go home at night, but absolutely integrating it into the way your organization works. Are there any more questions? Yes, sir. But just a follow up to that is um, the way you phrased your original question implied it is sort of what are the current savings versus the future benefits of recycling. One thing to emphasize is when we've done those numbers for Reading Studios, and right now, it is 25% cheaper to recycle than it is to go to landfill. And that's because the current regulatory environment means that landfill is an expensive form of waste for tax reasons. Um, and so you're always better to recycle now than you are to landfill. And in terms of energy production, we haven't fully run this, um, the review yet, but we know already from the outset that there are savings to be made, actual cash savings, by implementing um, photovoltaics at Ealing Studios and other forms of green energy supply. So it's not a question of future benefits. These are benefits that are available today. And I, you know, I think that's why I just wanted to emphasize that that's the rea you know, that, that reality is here. Any, any other questions? Yes. 
Um, I wanted to ask Tabitha whether she had any advice for anyone thinking about implementing the standard. Um, I think probably the key is to keep it quite simple in terms of what your management system is. Um, put it in place before you go into pre-production and then talk to talk to everyone in your company and everyone in the crew quite early on um, so everyone's behind it is the key, I think. Because in reality, everyone is so busy when you're making a film and so desperate to get it made in an efficient way, in the most creative way possible, that you can't, as a producer or production company, spend all your time looking at exactly what everyone is doing when building a set. So it's all about... Um, simple guidelines that everyone buys into, um, that you get, uh, you, you discuss with everyone and you, and you create together um, so that everyone wants to be involved. Final question? Uh, if not, um, let's call that a day. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I hope you'll take the opportunity to find out more about BS 8909 and all the arguments and processes that lie behind it by going to the BFI website or to the British Standards Institution website. It's a bit confusing having the BFI and the BSI. Uh, they are two different organizations uh, still at the moment. Uh, there's also the greeningfilm.com website uh, to explore. Thank you again for coming. I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists here and also James Spring from Ealing and most of all Amanda Neville from the BFI for coming and, uh, and, and adopting the approach that you have to helping to drive this standard because although it is something which has been owned by the industry and I do think that's a very important part of it, it's been created by the industry but the lead coming from the BFI is obviously hugely important in making sure that it gets the kind of traction that we hope it will within the industry. So thank you all for your participation. Yes, sir. And just before you, can I just say, you will all be delighted to know that you're now all invited to lunch on the terrace. <laughs> sir. Um, oh, firstly, I, um, it's our film Wasteland, which was shown. So we're really happy to be part of that. So all those garbage things. So thank you for using our film. Um, which you did correctly also. Um, but uh, is there anything, any documentation simply that we can take away um, on all of this? Which would be great. Because I actually have to give a speech on, on green filmmaking, which I know nothing about. So it would be great next week, because now I'm the eco film guy because I made Wasteland. So it would be great to I'm just, it would be fantastic. Yeah, we can give you stuff and we'd be happy to talk. Okay. And is there a European standard which is being created? No. Not for film, on sustainability. No. Okay. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>